Good evening, and welcome to Friday Night Live at the Parish Art Museum. I'm Alicia Longwell. I'm the Lewis B. and Dorothy Coleman Chief Curator here at the museum, and it's my great pleasure to be with you tonight. As you may know, out of an abundance of caution and in support of efforts to slow the spread of COVID-19, the museum galleries are temporarily closed, planning to reopen in early spring based on an assessment of the spread of infection in our community. So everyone stay safe and well. The Meadow and Field of Dreams installations of sculpture remain open from 11 to five daily and are free to all visitors. The gates will be open and security will be on duty. We will continue to offer a full program of online museum experiences and a program every Friday night. And you'll find all that detailed on the website. The museum's year round Friday night programs are made possible by the generosity of our presenting sponsor, Bank of America, with additional support from our very good friends, Sandy and Stephen Pearlbinder. It's a distinct pleasure tonight to be speaking about the painters, Fairfield Porter and Jane Freilicher with my good friend, Eric Brown. Eric was co-owner from 1994 to 2017 of the storied t Bordinage Gallery, the space that introduced a group of prominent American painters long associated with the East End and including Jane Freilicher and Fairfield Porter. He's organized many shows featuring these artists and their circle, numerous of those of, with their poet friends, John Ashbery, Frank O'Hara, James Schuyler, and Kenneth Koch. He is currently hosting a series of pop-up exhibitions in East Hampton with the drawing room. The first was Fairfield Porter and Jane Freilicher, and now presenting Lois Dodd and Alex Katz. I can't think of anyone I'd rather spend <laughs> an hour with talking about this. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you for having me. Yeah. By way of introduction, we'd like to show a few clips from a CBS Sunday morning program, um, actually filmed on the occasion of the parish's 1993 Fairfield Porter retrospective. Our own Anthony Mason is the interviewer and Jane Freilicher will speak about her fellow painter. Fairfield Porter. You will also hear Porter in his own words, which is a real treat, I must say. Um, a brief clip from the film uh, made in 1993, A Day in the Life of a Cleaning Woman, starring Fairfield Porter and his wife, and the poet Anne Channing Porter, well, made by their good friend, the distinguished photographer and filmmaker, Rudy Burkhart, will also be in there, a clip of that. And, um, I think we'll go to that right now. Thank you, Victor. A retrospective of Fairfield Porter's work at the Parish Art Museum in Southampton, New York this summer has renewed interest in Porter, who may have described his own work best in 1968 when he spoke of his admiration for the French artist, Vuillard. Uh, that's what I like in, in Vuillard, is that he, uh, he it, it seems to be ordinary what he's doing, but uh, the extraordinary is, is, is everywhere, I mean. <laughs> In the yard of the Porter's home in 1953, friend Rudy Burkhart made a short film. A Day in the Life of a Cleaning Woman featured Ann Porter as the maid. The part of Elmer Turnip, handyman with a lawnmower, was played by Fairfield Porter. He had this very youthful kind of vitality and uh, sort of a springiness to his step and his mind. He was very quirky and yet very uh, tremendously well-educated and a civilized person and with a very original turn of mind. Jane Freilicker was a young artist when she met Porter in 1952. He liked her use of color and at least twice she posed for Porter. He painted a picture of me and my daughter who was uh, about two years old at that time. 
and when he died, his wife gave that picture to me and my husband. And uh, although I liked it very much, somehow it was very hard to have it. It reminded me too much of Fairfield. And so we donated it to the Paris Museum. And, uh, so and now, of course, it looks wonderful to me. And I think, why did I ever do that? <laughs> Expressionism doesn't interest me very much. But visualness interests me very much. And it must be that first time in this. The world starts in this picture. That's what I'm interested in doing, I think. We were painters, and we were painting whatever we could paint. I would like to be a trendsetter or to be a, you know, a paragon of the new, but uh, one can only do what comes out, you know, what one feels. That's the thing about Fairfield's painting that's so wonderful that they are so uh, authentic. That's a wonderful, wonderful sort of introduction, both to, to Jane and to hear the words from uh, Fairfield as well. Um, it really, I uh, hope, sets, sets the tone for this moment. Um, Eric, I, I know you have had a long association with Jane. How long were, were you with her at Tibor? Or was she with you? Um, I, let's see, I, 1997, um, up until her death in 2014. Right. And I actually, I got to know Jane when I was in college and through uh, the artist Nell Blaine, uh, met John Ashbery through her. I actually used to check Jane's mail when she'd spent the summer in Watermill for the first few years after that. So it was a long association, it was wonderful. And um, we started representing her and had a whole group of shows. Wow, how interesting. Um, and you have for a long time lived here in summers and be our newest resident. <laughs> That's right. Yes. My family has a house in Amagansett, so I've spent many years here. Yeah. Glad to be here. If we want to bring up the uh, slides, we can look at those, rather the PowerPoint. See. Um, if we really want to go back to when uh, I don't know if we can get the exact moment, but when Fairfield and uh, Jane uh, would have met, we know the story of uh, at one of her first shows at Tibor, uh, Porter, who was also a really fantastic art critic, sort of brought into art news by Elaine de Kooning and Tom Hess to write, as did so many of the painters then and so many of the poets. But um, take us back to that moment. Well, Fairfield Porter visited Jane's studio in advance of her first show at Tibor Dinaj in 1952. And he wrote um, a very short one paragraph review of the show. In those days, the critics would visit the studios first and review it. Uh, and in it, he called her work traditional and radical. And from there, uh, they developed a friendship and um, just kind of a nourishing communication back and forth about painting. Uh, but that was the first moment that they met. And then through Jane and de Kooning and Larry Rivers' insistence, John Myers, who ran the Tibor Dinaj Gallery, um, according to Myers, took Porter's work on sight unseen on their recommendations. Uh, and so actually Jane and Fairfield Porter had their first shows at Tibor Dinaj in 1952, the same year, I think what's so interesting is she was in her mid late twenties and he was in his mid forties when this all happened. And so in a way it was kind of a gateway for Porter to be introduced to a whole group of younger artists and poets. And I think, you know, it was, he's written about this that it was just um, nourishing for him to be able to be among those people. And I think it influenced his work greatly very quickly. He hadn't had that kind of adoring young audience among painters and I think it was very encouraging. Right. The, the words he chose to describe her, traditional and radical, could almost be used to describe his work as well. I mean, how, how are they different from the, what about ways they do were different from maybe the prevailing uh, art of the times, which was of course more expressionistic, the abstract expressionists? Well, in, in those days, the, the prevailing winds, it was about abstract expressionism. And if you didn't 
kind of toe the party line, you were, you know, you were doing something very different. It took a lot of courage for both of them to be independent and to kind of keep to their path. Um, the Bonard show at the Museum of Modern Art in 1948, I think gave them both courage among other artists like Larry Rivers, where they could see what was done. And there was a kind of intimacy to those paintings and representation of everyday life. And that really um, influenced both of them. And I think they had that in common. So because of kind of the camps that existed in those days, I think there was an immediate camaraderie and a feeling of finding kind of her people, his people, uh, in terms of um, kind of sticking up for what they were doing. And I think it really gave them both courage to do it. Yeah. Of course, Jane had studied with the emigre, uh, German expressionist artist, um, Hans Hoffman in Provincetown. And, and as most artists of her generation were, were painting abstractly. And then she eventually said she thought she had need of the scene, the S-E-E-N and what was in the world around her. I was so taken by what um, the clip of, of Porter saying, um, referring to, um, you know, in that, in that same vein, thinking of the first timeness, in other words, looking at the world for the first time, and that each painting starts a look at the world anew, in a way, and uh, that's- Yeah, I think the main time, uh, yeah. I think they, but they both, were able to maintain that um, for both their painting careers. I know for Jane, when she started a painting, she had to have that spark. She had to find the thing that interested her to get the painting started to begin with. And she basically would try to carry that through, that kind of aliveness for the subject. And Porter, very much the same thing. I think they both, you know, wanted to capture those moments in life that are kind of, you know, fleeting, but that they wanted to capture the everyday kind of a domesticity. Um, and I think both of those things involved really being able to see things for the first time and appreciating that kind of nuance of kind of day-to-day -day life. Right. This is, uh, we sort of figured out was in the house that um, uh, Jane and her husband probably uh, rented a couple of summers before um, they actually built a house there. Let's go to the next slide, please, Victor, or PowerPoint. Uh, this is Porter's 1952 portrait of Freilicher. This, um, judging by the background, is a, a studio he was maintaining in New York at the time. And uh, certainly with the Bonar that they had seen and um, in the short film clip talking, he, he spoke of, Porter spoke about we are also with that idea of making something really modern, you know, out of a traditional portrait. And, and as you say, using family and friends and fellow artists and fellow poets as the subjects of these work. That's the next, next picture. Oh, this is an amazing <laughs> work. Um, this is in the collection of the Parish Art Museum. It's from 1954. I will say that uh, as many of our audience know, we were given an extraordinary, extraordinary gift by the uh, Porter's estate uh, after his death of about over 200 works that were actually in the house and studio uh, at the time he, he died. And uh, this is one of them. This is a painting he returned to, um, was it about 10 years later? 1966. Yeah, you might have caught a glimpse of it, in, uh, which we did borrow in 1993 for the exhibition. But do you want to say a little bit about this? It's such an yeah, interesting work. I, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by this because I hadn't kind of connected the dots. Um, Porter painted the later work in 1966. This piece from 54, he did from a sketch. Uh, Jane Freilicher and her husband rented a house up in Nyack, New York, mm -hmm. and the Porters visited them and they painted out in the backyard. Um, Porter did a sketch, brought it back to the studio and then did this painting from it. He was never quite happy with it. Um, there was kind of lack of information in the sense that he didn't paint it with the subject in front of him. He had this kind of sketch. And so in a sense, there are a lot of very flat areas where he didn't have the details for it and it kind of created that feeling for it. Um, he revisited the painting and did a second painting in 1966. Uh, it, um, it's a piece, as you mentioned, was in the clip. 
And it just interests me because I don't know that Porter revisited and kind of did a do-over in a sense of the same painting before. I, I posted this on Instagram some time ago and there was a very interesting thread about it. And a number of people noted that it was very Katzian, you know, Alex Katz, that it had that nice. flat planes of color. And Katz was definitely an influence on Porter. Um, Porter claimed that many people didn't like this painting at the time, but he did and that the flatness came from lack of information of the subject. So he said, you know, instead of trying to make it up, he just kind of used very blocky color. But I think this kind of, it seems like a gateway for his later paintings, you know, when they did palette brightened, um, there was a simplification. And um, this to me has that luminosity. Yeah. You know, it's often the case with Porter and saying that people found it reminiscent of cats and also, you know, people, will remark that sometimes you hear that Robert Dash and, and Fairfield Porter painted so much alike. And I think sometimes the subject matter, which is similar, you might say, in, in all three and, and also with Jane, sort of contributes to that. But when you see the paintings next to each other, they're vastly, vastly different. It's interesting. But every painter takes from every other painter. Yeah, and also is, you know, Porter dying before he, the age of 70. Yeah. To me, it's sometimes I imagine what he would have gone on to do because his paintings, he went from strength to strength and I think they just got better and better. Um, mm -hmm. Jane Freilicher, of course, and Alex Katz, who is still going strong at 93, you yeah. know, they, they've had these periods after. And I think in a way there was a um, coming together in the 60s and late 50s with their work and in terms of what they were thinking about. But after that, I think both Jane and Alex kind of took their own route. And if you look at a later Freilicher and a Porter from this period, you'll see real differences. But unfortunately, Porter didn't quite have that opportunity because he, um, you know, died too soon. It's an interesting observation. Uh, Victor, next, please. This is interesting. This is a discovery. I don't think it's ever been widely seen, right? It, it, to my knowledge, it hasn't been exhibited. This is um, a portrait of Fairfield Porter uh, at the typewriter. And I had never seen this work before after Jane died, when the inventory of her studio was done and of all her work, this piece was in her flat file, just as you see it in perfect condition. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the circumstances of it, but it's a beautiful painting. It really captures him at the typewriter. I imagine writing an art review or a poem okay. and um, it has not been exhibited before. And I think it's just, it's just a really evocative piece. It is. Did Jane write poetry? I can't remember. Jane wrote, early on she wrote some poetry um, and she actually, there's a painting we're gonna see in this presentation of a car and she and Kenneth Koch collaborated on a poem called The Car. And it's a very clever, fun kind of ditty in a sense, but uh, she didn't write a lot of poetry, but she did write. Yeah, uh, next please. This is from 1957, Life Magazine. Um, it's an article on Hans Hoffman and his students. He's there upper right. Jane is just below his hands there with her painting. Uh, Larry Rivers is on the, which one is Larry? <laughs> which one is Larry? I can't. I think count. he might be on the next page of this piece. I think the, I think it may be. Okay, I know he's also in the article as a yeah. student, but. Um, tell a little bit about that, uh, the painting that she's posing with for this article. Yeah, the, um, the painting is called The Electric Fan, and um, it's, it's a fascinating painting. It, it was actually uh, in the artist's estate when Jane died. Uh, Kasman Gallery did a show two years ago of her works from the 50s and exhibited really for the first time since it was exhibited back when she painted it. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's... Um, currently in a show at the Brattleboro Museum on figurative artists that the critic uh, curator Karen Wilkin has put together. And uh, yeah, it's, it's terrific and it's kind of fun to make this association with Jane Pose next to it there. And th this was a very big deal for a young artist, all the artists pictured here who, you know, sort of made this uh, broadside in, the, in Life magazine as up and coming artists. Next. Mm, love this. This is great. And talk about 
talk about painting the everyday. Right. <laughs> what they looked at every day. And uh, this painting by Jane Freilich, or the, well, the Fairfield Porter is in the Parish Collection, right. I, I believe. Um, yeah. The painting table of Jane's, uh, she actually gave to John Ashbery, the poet, and it hung above his couch in Chelsea for all of those years. Um, it will be actually exhibited in an upcoming show at Kasman Gallery, uh, the gallery which represents her estate. And that show opens this month actually on the 21st of January and it will focus on still life painting. And this piece will be in it. But I love the diaphanous um, curtain in the background and right. just you know, painting the palette. Uh, it's just, it's a really kind of wonderful painting. The um, Ashbury once wrote about uh, Porter that order in his paintings, order seems to come from disorder and awkwardness from searching for harmony, which uh, is pretty apt when talking about this painting uh, oh. as well. I know uh, Jane and, and John Ashbury were very close friends of all the sort of mix of painters and poets in that period. They probably had the longest uh, friendship from, would you say, I think they, oh, Jane would have a, am I right, have a birthday party for him most every year? Every, every July, yes, end of July every year, John and his husband, David, would come out and Jane always had a party for him. And it was a lovely way for John's friends to gather at Jane's every year. Great, next please. And this is the great, um, Portrait of Jane and her daughter Elizabeth, which um, as she she says in the film clip uh, that she gave back. Did she say no? She gave it to the museum, but that it was originally given to her uh, by Ann Porter. But you heard a different story. Well, I I think it was in Justin Spring's biography. Oh yeah. I read that at the time the painting was made that Porter and, and Jane traded paintings and he gave it to Jane and he couldn't decide what painting he wanted in exchange. So he took a portrait of John Ashbery that Jane had done the year before and a still life painting. And we actually have an image of that, that Freilicher portrait of John uh, anyhow, but, but I think, um, so I'm not really quite sure if Jane never claimed the painting and Anne after um, Fairfield Porter's death gave it to her and mm -hmm. also probably gave John Ashbery the portrait um, to have as well, so. As well. So this is actually just outside um, uh, Freilicher's house in um, Watermill. Yeah, it was the side of the studio. And I love this, looking at the photo side by side, if you look that her daughter Elizabeth is wearing a different outfit and mm -hmm. it becomes clear to me that you know, a two-year-old, it would be hard for a two-year-old to pose. And it obviously, it seems like it was done over a couple days. Sure, right. Or two-year-olds can run through outfits too. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> well, that's true. But that's, uh, um, I think there's another pit, but there's definitely more than one sitting. I think Porter actually has on a different uh, shirt, maybe in another photograph, mm -hmm. but uh, Jade is true to her, her violet uh, colored uh, shift dress there. Very yeah, interesting. Elizabeth's jumper reminds me of that paisley print in Porter's studio that was on that couch. Yes. Yeah. Enjoy yeah. cleaning these patterns. He really did that. Uh, really, the certainly from Vuillard and Bonar to love to paint those complicated, complicated patternings. I often thought, why didn't he just throw a white sheet over the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the couch and be done with it? But uh, no. He also has a, he has so many portraits of people's flip-flops on, which I love. <laughs> yes, it was that period. And look at bare feet. It's very, it's amazing that these paintings, in a sense, be, they become kind of uh, history painters because yeah. that landscape really, those potato fields were really that open not so long ago. Right, right. Next. Thank you. Uh, this is a great portrait of John Ashbery. Subtitled, <laughs> uh, Argyle socks with good reason. <laughs> maybe to focus on the socks. Yeah, they're beautiful. Yeah, yeah. This, this painting belonged to John and he loved the painting. Um, the painting has been on long-term loan at the National Portrait Gallery. I mean, John loaned it when he was um, still alive and he died a couple years ago and 
um, it remains on view there as far as, far as I understand. It's a great, also sort of reminiscent of uh, Elaine de Kooning's wonderful portraits of men. Uh, Porter, in fact, one of, uh, by Elaine de Kooning of Porter. She was, as I said, a noted critic, but a really extraordinary por por portrait painter as well. And she had that same uh, feeling for painting her circle, uh, people in the art world. I love, just like the um, flip-flops, there's a portrait of Jane Wilson where her flip-flop was on the floor next to one and she's wearing the other. But I love the way his right foot, Porter captures just those small details. Right. Of, 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 you know, he probably posed for hours and was exhausted. He looks not so happy there, but um, <laughs> yeah, just like one of those, those moments like that, that really kind of give it kind of a real sense of immediacy of the moment. Mm -hmm. And Ashbury, whom he painted many times, really, over the course yeah. of the years. Um, next. Two, two, two more from the circle of poets, um, James Schuyler, Jimmy Schuyler, and Kenneth Koch. Um, sort of a stylistic change, you would say, with, for Jane, or? Uh, well, she was, during that period, I mean, there was a great, she was painting in her studio in Long Island, and there was a great kind of um, capturing the light, mm -hmm. the light of the, of, of, of the um, Hamptons. Um, what interests me is that um, John Ashbery lived in Paris for 10 years and returned to the United States to live in 1966. And mm -hmm. we'll see another portrait of John Ashbery here. Uh, and Jane seemed to be kind of in this moment where John returned. And I imagine she did the portrait of John. Um, in those days, going back and forth, particularly when you're a poet and didn't have the means, was a big deal. So he didn't come back to New York very often during that period. They wrote a lot of letters to each other. But um, yeah, so she, it seems to have kind of engaged the subjects and she painted not only um, Kenneth Koch, but also John Ashbery among other figure paintings, other portraits. Wonderful. Uh, next, please. Ah, this is the Ashbery. That's the one. Yeah. The unfinished. Yes, they, it's, it's somehow referred to as unfinished, although it's signed. So we know it's finished. Uh, and I think what's so remarkable, I mean, I think Porter as well, uh, she kind of knew when to leave a painting alone, you know, and it takes a certain confidence to let that kind of hang out and say, okay, it's done. That's, that's kind of ground and canvas showing through on the bottom, you know, kind of sketchy. Um, but I think it's, um, it's, it's just, it's a great painting. Yeah, in fact, there's a painting from the 50s of, I didn't know it had always been called an unidentified man. It's in uh, the very um, sort of um, identifiable um, desk lamp with a great green, like a 19th century with a green globe. And it's a man sitting there reading. And I, f I ran across somewhere in Ashbury writing that that indeed was him mm -hmm. uh, posing in the, because there's absolutely no facial features. So again, that's a um, painting that was signed and uh, but just not identified in any way that was left in the estate. So um, come to find out that uh, he spoke about it as a finished painting without his facial features, which I think he found rather odd. But well, um, it, it actually resembles him. I remember Elaine de Kooning often painted artists without features and just based on the weight of their shoulders and the way they sat or stood, they were able to capture these things. So I think that was an interesting uh, challenge that they posed for each other. Right, right. Um, okay, next. Thank you. This, in fact, the photograph on the left is one that Porter himself took uh, the day he bought this house, basically. He, um, he was living in the city uh, with the family. They had a small townhouse in Midtown and he thought, um, his family had, and this, the, he and his four siblings had grown up at a family island, really, um, in Great Penobscot Bay, Great Spruce Head. Uh, his father had built a home there. Uh, they were a family of some means uh, from Chicago, grew up in Winnetka, and his father was an architect, although he didn't work extensively uh, in the field. He did build several houses for the uh, family, and this beautiful um, 
island in Maine to which uh, uh, Porter and as I say, the four siblings came. Porter was only five when he spent his first summer there. So that was his, uh, he has called them the, the golden days of their childhood there. He was enormously attached to it and went every summer. He said that at that point in his life, he didn't know if he'd be able to afford to take his family there every summer. So he wanted a place um, out of the city that was near the ocean and he chose Southampton for that reason. And um, he found this house. It's a beautiful 19th century captain's house on South Main Street, right in the village. I took a picture and brought it home and showed Anne. I think she just had had a, a, a new child and didn't travel out with him. And that's where they lived. It's a beautiful house. Had a um, stable in the back as many of those 19th century houses did. And he converted that, um, certainly the top, the hayloft level uh, to his studio, which we'll see. And this is the house that uh, Jane and her husband, Joe Hazen built in what, 61? Right? Uh, yeah, 1960. They bought the land a uh, couple years before that, uh -huh. they built the house. And then Jane would go back to New York and paint kind of very abstract, interesting landscapes, kind of inspired by this new landscape, this new environment she was in. She would add a studio, a separate structure a couple years later, and then, then she started painting there from her view. This is um, three, um, three acres, which they bought um, on Flying Point as it turns around on uh, Neecox Bay and uh, sort of abuts the Henry Ford land there. It's beautiful, beautiful. But interesting that both Porter, who is on the second floor of the stable and uh, has that elevated height, and mm -hmm. uh, Jane from the, from the studio that she used also has that sort of elevated height over the dunes into the Yeah, water. She, she built, her first studio was, ground, was on the first floor. Mm -hmm. Uh, she built a larger studio that was around 1962. She built a larger studio around 1970, kind of adjacent to the other structure. And that was the second floor. I don't really know what the decision making in that was really involved, but it, it did change. And you can see the shift in her paintings. You're really aware of a slight elevation. She could see the landscape and see further um, into the horizon. And it, it did change things, but it was a beautiful view. Mm -hmm. And she, um... I think we have a picture in the studios, but she famously once said, um, and I remember a painting that, of course she had this view over the surrounding area and thought, you know, she should really paint to the sort of gouge in the earth that was the uh, moving for the a house to be built. So if she said, I, I paint like this because I have no imagination. <laughs> in other words, she's gonna paint what she sees. Uh, even if it's not uh, pleasing to her there in the landscape. All right, next, Victor, thank you. This is from a very important, well-known series in art news at the time in the 50s and late 50s and 60s called The Artist, or here, Porter Paints a Picture. Um, it was um, most often <laughs> this small group of friends, poets, uh, they often wrote about one another, uh, painted one another, uh, photographed one another. Uh, these are Burkhardt photographs, as I, I recall. And um, it's Frank O'Hara who's writing the article on Porter Paints a Picture. We don't have an image of it, but, um, and I think, do you remember the year that Jane's was? 1955. 55, and it was, um, Porter writing the article. Do you want to say a few words about that? Well, I think what's so interesting is that Tom Hess, who was the editor at Art News, ushered in this series that was kind of went through the 50s. And they always had the same format. They had the artist's signature and then paints a picture. And it really was not just a profile about the artist, but it was sitting there with Rudy often and other photographers mm -hmm. watching an artist paint a picture. And they would describe the palette, what they what they were painting, what their um, process was, and I, these are great records to have. The piece that um, Porter wrote on Jane kind of follows this very much, and um, Tom has hired a bunch of young poets to write these articles and painters. Fairfield Porter, Elaine de Kooning did some, 
Um, but it's just, a, they're just wonderful articles because these poets brought a whole other eye to kind of this kind of subject matter and how they wrote about it. And it was also, they were young kids who needed money and it was just a great way uh, for them to uh, write about their friends in a sense. Right. Uh, Skyler, yeah. Yeah. Skyler also did reviews and of course, as did yeah. Ashbery. And Coke, not, not as much, I don't think. He was always yeah. a very uh, uh, highly regarded, he was always a te professor, teacher. Yes. So I think he, that was, <laughs> that was his day job. But uh, very interesting series. And you're right, they do, they're an ex extraordinary historical documents. And you just, uh, because painting a picture, a portrait, you know, kind of like grass growing at a point. You, <laughs> you have to be, it's over a long period of time. Uh, okay, next, Victor. Ah, here are the studios. Um, and yeah. Anne posing patiently. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, the one concession, I guess, that uh, Porter made to the hayloft, he did put in the, that uh, window that you see. Uh, that's no, uh, north window for the light. Uh, oddly enough, he sometimes painted it in or out or with mullions or as a clear glass, um, many, you know, different ways. And on the northeast, on the east side um, were the hayloft doors, which when they were flung open uh, were virtually, a, you know, an open wall. So he almost had a panoptic view uh, around from the, on the rooftops of uh, Southampton. And that's Jane. <laughs> Must have been fairly new, looking south as she did towards the Mecox and the uh, the ocean. Yeah, the views from her studio looked in several directions, so she mm -hmm. was able to pivot with the easel and look one way from one painting and another from the other. And sometimes she would even combine views. She would do this kind of improvised painting where she took something from one view and put it in with the other. Um, when she built the studio she actually wanted to build it a couple feet higher and she petitioned the town to uh, get a variance for that and they turned her down, but um, it still was a great studio. Interesting, I didn't know that. Uh, next slide, please. And here's two beautiful paintings uh, of the artist in the studio. Um, the one on the left, the porter with the, um, and again, you can see that, uh, big picture window that was mullioned in one sense and, and now isn't. It looks across the road to the other little house. Uh, he did paint the studio a Tintoretto pink, which he thought made everyone look better. And this sort of wonderful, almost uh, Velasquez-esque uh, play with the mirror and the self of the artist and the reflection uh, of the mirror and the young girl there. And, and the, the, uh, the geometry in both paintings is just so wonderful. The compositions of both of them. I mean, there's awareness of abstraction as they presented the world, as they saw it and the way they framed what they were painting. Uh, the piece of Jane's was, is now in the National Academy of Design collection and has been for many years. When artists become members of the National Academy of Design, it's a long tradition they're required to donate a self-portrait. I think that's been done away with, but this was one that she donated when she became a member there. Um, next, Victor. <laughs> this is Porter at his show at uh, Debordinage in 62, uh, apparently his own Chevrolet van which uh, it was a little hard to figure out where this might be because it doesn't look like Maine per se, uh, although it might be another part of the island, I don't know. He was, uh, he, <laughs> you don't often see him in pictures with quite such a happy expression. I think he must have been uh, very, 62 would have been not his first show? No, it was, it was his first show was in 52, yeah. but the gallery had, at that point moved up to 72nd Street just off of Madison Avenue and it was a big departure for them. It was kind of stepping up and um, that where he's seated there was a bay window that faced on the second floor 72nd Street where they often showed paintings and so he's kind of sitting in the corner there. Um, Lee Krasner's studio was 
they shared a wall basically. It was right next door, which is how they learned of the space. So it, it um, yeah, it was just a really kind of wonderful um, space. And um, that painting looks, it's hilly. So I don't know how, where it is painted. It looks a little bit like Porter's later Amherst. But yeah, the, it does, it does. That's a But the date was 62. So I don't know, I'm not quite clear about that. Maybe the date's wrong, but that was what, um, what it's written. Yeah. Okay, next. Here's the car. And this is the painting I'd mentioned that um, Kenneth Koch and Jane collaborated on a poem for, and it was actually, there was a literary magazine called Locus Solus in those days. And the painting was reproduced on one side in black and white and the poem appeared opposite and on the same spread. So it was kind of fun to be able to read the poem and look at the painting at the same time. Now, Tibor had an active publications. Yes, Tibor Dinaj Editions yeah. published a lot of the poet friends of Porter and Freilichers. Uh, Jane contributed um, drawings to John Ashbery's small uh, book that was put out in the early 50s. And then much later on, um, a book of Fairfield Porter's poems was published through the gallery with his ink right. drawings. And that was, um, that is just that's a great book, but his poems hadn't been published at that point. Right. Was this, was this a golden age, would you say? I mean. Yeah, I, I, I think it really was. I think that there was, um, there was a kind of nourishing communication between all of them. They all were nearby. Um, there was clearly, there was an exchange of ideas. I think it was a very exciting time. I think Porter's paintings changed considerably during this period because I think he was having conversations with this, this group of artists. Um, I think he was inspired and energized by the young poets. So I think it seemed like a very exciting period. You know, Porter would have a, an apartment in the city where he would go a few days a week. Uh, and it really was the purpose of socializing, seeing shows right. and being present, but he didn't really paint there later on. Um, but yeah, I think it was a really special time. Uh, next slide. This is a wonderful painting of Porter's called Calverton, which of course is on the uh, North Shore. Um, <laughs> with the speeding car and the speeding, uh, speeding clouds. Um, this is a good size painting. And um, I think he, you know, he often did small works on, on Masonite, which you might call sketches, if not finished paintings. But uh, when he, he had a real sense of a sort of sweeping action in, in the, the larger scale paintings, I think that he did of these landscapes. It's a wonderful, wonderful out in the potato fields. Um, let's have the next slide. We're coming to the end. This is um, both pictures from Great Spruce Head. You wanna talk about the group on the left? Sure. Uh, they, they kind of, they went on a road trip. Um, John Ashbery and James Schuyler was up there living with the Porters for the summer. Um, Jane and John and Jane's husband, Joe Hazen, went up there. Um, to my knowledge, that was the only visit that Jane made to Great Spruce Head. Um, John Ashbery, I think, was there once in the 50s. Um, but they, um, this is a picture taken by Joe Hazen. Uh, they spent several days there. And this is uh, Porter in the foreground. Um, that's John Ashbery's back, Jane, and that's uh, James Schuyler behind them. Yeah. And on the right is a picture, a uh, photograph taken by Anina Porter Fuller, who is a uh, niece of um, uh, Fairfields and um, to this day runs an important um, artist retreat there um, on, the, uh, on the island. Um, she's been a great um, ambassador, you would say for his work, wonderful painter herself. Uh, I think we have one more slide, pairing. You know, I couldn't resist. Um, Jane once said, um, 
she was extremely fond of Fairfield. And as you you heard when she she he spoke of when she spoke about him, I I often thought maybe Brooklyn. Brooklyn born and bred, she hadn't quite encountered anyone quite, quite like Fairfield um, at, at that point. And uh, she spoke of him as, um, uh, he looked as though he would, came out of the pages of Boy's Life, which is a boy's, you know, magazine, teenage magazine. And he does, I think, in these uh, pictures. And also she said, actually, it's what we would now call preppy. You know, he had that uh, a demeanor. And I must say that's, I think the only time I've ever heard Porter's voice in a recording and he that was on the the clip we showed at the very beginning and he sounds very youthful I would say you know could have been done when he was 50 or 60 but uh, a very youthful sounding voice and I think probably he I mean others most of the other well the three poets were also Harvard educated so he had that in common uh, with them uh, that experience, but um, he was a you know beloved member of this um, circle, which yes, and his and his youthful appearance was often remarked upon and became somewhat of a joke between his younger friends. They right. would say, "Oh, you know, I saw Fairfield, and he looked even younger than the time before." So I think uh, he always maintained that boyishness, and I think that's in part why his death was such a shock because he always seemed the picture of health. Right, right. He um, went out to walk Dear Bruno one morning in, on South Main and collapsed and uh, was later found. Very sad, very far too young. Um, I think we have some chats or questions or comments and um, I should have mentioned before, please, if you'd like to make a comment, you'll see at the bottom of the screen, the chat bubble. You can, um, Tom Edmonds, hello, our wonderful historical society is with us. And, or ask questions, I saw a question. Where can I, Irene would like to know, where can I read the poem that goes with the car? Love that painting. Um, well, Locus Solus is rare. It's, they're hard to find. You can Google it online. I did not have any luck finding it on there. Um, I put together, edited a catalog um, for the T. Bordenage Gallery's 65th anniversary, and I reproduced it in there. Um, and so I, that is available online, and you can find it there. And that actually has the car painting reproduced in there as well. Ah, OK, great. Um, let's see. This is um, young Miss McQuinney, who says, Fairfield Porter painted my grandmother. Indeed, he did, Inez McQuinney. I know the portrait, yeah. Yeah, it's a wonderful portrait that the museum has, yeah. And, oh, Rebecca, hi, Rebecca. She, uh, Rebecca Allen says, I think that the, the band was in Amherst, it may well be. We should check on that, Amherst. He was a visiting professor uh, one fall semester, judging. And that was in the 70s, as far as I know, right? Wasn't that? He was later, yeah. But he may have been there for, for something. I mean, he loved Amherst. And uh, uh, gorgeous, gorgeous pictures of um, full color, the full New England um, color. And um, parking lots and snowscapes. At, yes. Always parking lots too. Yeah. He had another. His studio was up on the third floor of a building, and he had that other uh, that panoptic view. Um, did Porter visit the Hudson Valley? The road painting with the van reminds me of the Taconic Roadway. I'm sure he passed through it, but I don't know that he ever spent time uh, in the Hudson Valley. Thanks for a wonderful program. All right. Do you think there's an appreciation for these two geniuses in today's audiences? Yes. <laughs> I, I have to tell a story about a graduate art class uh, taught by Rikrit Trevajna at Columbia University who came and who saw Porter show. This is going back a couple of years. And 
um, I didn't meet the group at the time and they um, sort of got wind that there were many more porters in our collection and, and they asked if they could come back as a group and see things that were in storage. And we said, well, of course, that would be wonderful. And this um, group of students, I thought, well, they must be very into things and very interesting. And I thought maybe we better give them a little background on poetry and William Carlos Williams and the images and things like that. You know, I thought I'd fill in a few blanks for them. Well, I, when I mentioned William Carlos Williams, uh, who wrote a famous poem called The Red Wheelbarrow. And there's a painting that Porter did called The Red Wheelbarrow. And he's often talked about his, the sort of a, a comparison between his, William, William's um, poems and his own work. At, at any rate, I began to, at the mention of William Carlos Williams, a young student in the first um, sort of standing right in front of me, recited the entire poem from memory. And I said, well, you guys are way ahead of me. And when we went in to look at all the paintings, as I said, it's a large group. They were absolutely enthralled. And um, we asked them, what is it that attracts you as younger artists? And uh, several said it, it, this was the authenticity, you know, the, 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 the absolute re just that it was so authentic in what the paintings depicted and you could really almost tell what the artist was was thinking and what was on his mind and what in fact had prompted that i, I like that idea of the first timeness that phrase yeah. that he used what a great yeah. use of hyphenation right and first right. timeness that it, everything is that fresh it's that fresh and authentic and right in front of him and that would, would be my response, uh, certainly one group. And, and, and certainly figurative painting is much more uh, uh, done now. I mean, every, you know, all bets are off in a way there's not, I don't think you could call a dominant style in many ways that abstract expressionism or expressionism dominated um, the scene. Yeah, um, no, I think, I think we're at a very exciting place because there's a kind of, an opening of the field, a kind of pluralism in the art world these days. And there are a lot of younger artists, uh, some of whom are exhibiting widely and getting attention, yeah. who are looking at representational painting, particularly Fairfield Porter, uh, Jane Freilicher, among others. And uh, Karma Gallery in New York did a terrific group show last summer called Flowers. Uh, and it was just, I think there were 90 works by many artists and they were, it was just a very fresh, interesting show. And it had this kind of very contemporary feeling. Porter was not in the show, but Jane was, Lois Dodd, a whole group of other artists. And their painting, look, they looked like they were done yesterday. They had a freshness to them and there were younger artists surrounding them as well. Even Matthew Wang, I mean, there were all sorts of wonderful um, painters. And so I think we're in a moment now, um, someone the other day when I'm, we're getting ready to put the Freilicher show up at Kasman, someone was told that this was the year of the, of the still life. And there's some truth to that. There's just something in the water stream right now where a lot of young artists, during the pandemic, you know, they're keeping their head down and working in the studio, but even prior to that, that there's something afoot. And it's been exciting because it's brought a whole new audience, both the Porter and the Freilicher's work, um, which has been great. You know, I think that's not always been the case. I think in Porter's case, from a museum point of view, I think there are a lot of curators, um, this present curator, um, except that there's a feeling, I think, that they didn't quite know what to do with Porter, that he wasn't, often he was put as an Americana painter, you know, Aikens and others who he admired, but in fact, he was a very modern painter and thought about very modern concerns. Um, you know, he was a modernist in a way. And so um, I think that's changing. I think a lot's changed recently, which is great. Only took. <laughs> it took a few years. No, it does. And we, you know, at the parish find ourselves with an uh, amorous richesse. I mean, um, depth is uh, an extraordinary thing to have in a museum. Um, and uh, we do have a wonderful, wonderful, full range of his work. And we're very, very fortunate. And we were able to, in a sense, play to our strengths uh, when reopening with the, the show. So, um, Eric? This has been great. Have we run out of time? Oh dear. Have you got any other questions? Q and A. Okay.
Have Porter and Fry like her paintings ever been exhibited alongside Bonar and Vuillard? Any chance there's an upcoming show of that, which would bring together these paintings of the everyday from Jamie Morris. What a great idea. <laughs> that sounds like a show I'd want to see. Yeah. Or maybe a show I'd want to organize. Yeah, no, it's a fabulous idea. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, it gets harder and harder to organize. I mean, I, you could find those paintings in, in the, the States, but it gets harder and harder to organize sort of international shows. Um, from Jen, what medium did Fairfield and Jane use? Primarily. Well, we can now launch into Porter's lifetime cause of the marriage and medium, which um, was, well, you can speak to that, right? It, it was, it was, I mean, it would have to be cooked up in a sense. It was it done by a lot of white lead and it, mm -hmm. some of it never dries. Uh, he did, it was a sort of a proprietary by Monsieur Merlger who um, had this, was a European who had come here and had this. I mean, I, I think Porter thought that it had quite, you know, properties that uh, sort of overcame it, the, the difficulty in, in using the paint. Um, it kind of gave it the kind of the consistency, kind of a buttery quality where you could paint wet into wet. And I think he found that really exciting. Uh, he kind of proselytized and he tried to get all of his friends to use it as well. In fact, um, even at the time of Jane's death, uh, pinned to the wall of her studio was this kind of very yellowed piece of paper that must have been there for many, many years with the recipe that Porter had supplied for her for that medium. And it was in Porter's hand and clearly she put it there. And I kind of like to think she wasn't, she, she never painted as far as I know, using it or even trying it. I know John Ashbery tried it once when he was visiting the Porters and um, that was great. But I think somehow having that by her, I think there's kind of something quietly sentimental about that. Somehow keeping Porter's flame alive in her studio and I think that was great but we never talked about it but it was there all those years. Did you take a picture of it? <laughs> no in fact leading up to this I actually asked Jane's daughter Elizabeth I said well we have a picture of that because when she died um, her archives are at Harvard and there was a very thorough videos made and interviews and photographs um, books on her bookshelf all that I have to look into it I hope so but I was hoping to produce one for this evening and I haven't been able to. That's wonderful. That is also a wonderful thing that, that her archive is there as well. Um, is there a list of the colors of Fairfield Porter's palette? I didn't think so. Had a very broad palette. You're better. Eric's a painter as well as all the other things she does. I am not. I don't think that's pretty not usual. I've never seen a palette that he used. Uh, a literal palette or a more figurative, he, um, I don't know. I, I would doubt it. I don't think there's been an inventory of that, but um, um, I think we've answered all the questions and uh, called out all the, you've been a wonderful group. Thank you. I know there are a lot of you out there and uh, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, Eric. This has been the best. Wonderful to talk with you and uh, look forward to seeing everything you're doing. Wait, if you did your draw panelists. Well, there's a bravo. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, uh, this has been a great pleasure. This has been a lot of fun and I appreciate great. you thinking of the evening and asking me to do it, so. Well, good. We'll have to come back. I think we've just scraped the surface. We could talk. Plenty to say, yeah. Thank you all. Be well and be safe, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.